Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Bless you. Let's read it right now. And then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Get out of here. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. This is one of the only times this word displeased is used in the New Testament. It's pretty serious. He's really frustrated. I don't want to pour into it or lean into it too much. Jesus is on his way to the cross. The teachings he's giving, the situations he's in, the circumstances that surround him. People picking fights with him, people missing it and blowing it. And all of a sudden, all these guys show up with their kids. The disciples make an executive decision. Jesus doesn't got time for your kids. Jesus gets frustrated. He's like, are you you serious? Lean into it. Jesus rebukes his disciples who were rebuking these dads. And then he said to his disciples, hey, let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. He doubles down, teachable moment. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and he blessed them. Man, I love this story. I love this story because of the context and when it's introduced to us. See, Jesus was approached by another group of guys right before this that didn't have their kids. They came to Jesus wanting to get cantankerous and fight with Jesus. Remember that group of guys that wanted to fight him and test him on marriage and divorce and they were trying to get him to divide his followers? They just wanted to fight Jesus. This other group of people, right on the heels of that group of people, bring their kids and say, Jesus, can you bless my kids? Being in the ministry is an interesting thing. You get some people wanting to fight you and attack you and get you down. Other people are calling you saying, would you bless my family? Would you minister to me? And it's an up and down reality. And Jesus here, I believe, is modeling his heart towards children at this very time. And I love it because I love kids and I hope you love kids too. Lord, bless that little crier that just left. There's kids in the sanctuary. There's kids downstairs. There's kids upstairs. Guys, have you looked around? Are you, is this, we're so blessed to have a church with a multi-generational congregation old people and young people and super old people and super young people. (laughs) It is a blessing and I thank Jesus for that. Some people pray, Lord, send youth to us, send people over, send young people. As a matter of fact, Newport Christian Church, great example, they're a smaller church in town, they've been around forever and ever. And years ago they were praying, Lord, would you just show us what to do? We'll do anything, great people over there. And we approached them about a few months later and said, hey, can we rent your facility and host South Beach Christian School here? They said, are you serious? We've been praying that our building would be useful to the Lord. Yes, you can do that. We rent the space from them. There's 120 students gathering there every single day being discipled in Jesus' name. And to have this heart and this desire for kids, as a matter of fact, South Beach Church is such a fun church because we love our kids. We love pouring into our kids. If you were to take a pie chart and if you were to examine how we spend our money here at South Beach Church, outside of our normal operating expenses and staff and salaries and insurance and all the staples, what else are we spending money on? And you went and saw youth and kids in the school, you would see that the majority of our money is spent on the next generation. It's spent on kids. More time, more money, more energy on the next generation. You know why we do this? Because kids are better than adults. I'm just kidding, but I'm also not kidding. I love adults, I love you guys, it's so fun. But one of the reasons I say that, I'll give you two reasons why I say that. Studies show that upwards of 75, depending on where you look, to 94% of every single person who becomes a believer before they die does so before the age of 18. Before they reach adulthood. The study went this way. 6% of adults became believers in their adulthood. 6% of believers got saved after age 18. And I love you guys. I love doing outreaches to adults. I love doing evangelism to adults, ministry to adults. But according to that statistic, the real success is everything 18 and under. That's where kids get saved. Let me give you a second reason why kids are better than adults. I'm saying it that way on purpose. You know what I mean. Because kids, if they do get saved at a young age, will have the opportunity to hopefully live their life effectively for decades on end, impacting other people. Now when an older person gets saved, let's say in their 60s or 70s or 80s, their eyes are open, their hearts are softened, they confess Jesus as Lord and they're saved. Do we celebrate that? Yeah! All of heaven, party time, play the music, DJ drops the bass, they get after it. 
That's what the Bible says. But when a young person gets saved, when a young person gets excited about Jesus, God can put a call on their life and they can change generations. And I say that to us, we're sitting here, it's very, you know, we've got a couple kids here and we've got a great kids room and you know, sometimes the kids get this distraction and we got one of the best, actually the best room, I was, I was thinking this through, if this is a true statement, I think it is, the best room in the entire four square church that we put together here is the mom's room. Downstairs, it's got a big screen TV and surround sound and comfy chairs and a mimosa bar there, you know. And <laughs> I'm just kidding, no mimosa bar. Because we just love families. And yet here we find him, yeah, mama, mimosa. Yeah, mama, that's a good idea. You're onto something there. Write that down. Jesus here, though, turns this into a teachable moment. You ever been wrong before? Anybody wrong before? <laughs> the worst is when you think you're right and you're wrong. How about that? I'm wrong all the time, but the worst is when you think you're right and you're doing stuff. The disciples, right before this, had shut down a group of people that were casting out demons. They're like, oh, you gotta stop all that. Not cool, knock it off. And they went back and they bragged to Jesus. We shut down that other church across town because they didn't have the right logo. <laughs> wrong denomination, wrong choir team. And Jesus is like, what'd you do? Dude, are you for, no, let them do it. If they're not against us, they're for us. And we get so jelly and so critical of other people that do it a little differently than us. Stop that. If Jesus is their king, man, fan the flame, okay? Throw fog, burn, get them stoked, pray for them. And they were wrong before, and now in this time, they're all so wrong, they see all these dads coming and bringing the kids to Jesus, and they're like, oh, Jesus doesn't have time for kids. And Jesus is like, oh, I got lots of time for kids. Uh, I guess he's got time. We were completely wrong. And I think it's important that we check our hearts and check our attitudes. And by the way, when you're wrong, unintentionally or intentionally, isn't God so gracious to turn that error into a teachable moment? Lean into this, because I forecast and I believe there's gonna be many more moments in your adulthood and in the rest of your life where you're gonna be wrong. Oh, why? Well, because God gets our attention during those frustrating times. And your obstacle can become, if you believe in Jesus, an opportunity for God to do a greater work in you. As a matter of fact, your failures, my failures, those are opportunities for amazing feedback. I think I failed you. I think I came up short. I, wanted, I don't wanna be the same as I was when I did that. What can I learn in this moment of uncomfortable sadness? Don't waste the pain of failures. They're teachable moments. And Jesus here demonstrates, I believe, his heart towards kids. He actually uses it as such a powerful, teachable moment. He doesn't just defend the kids. He, he doubles down. He's like, let me tell you about kids a little bit. You could learn a lot from kids. I remember before Crystal and I had our first kid 16 years ago, people started to tell us, oh, you're gonna learn a lot about God from your kids. And I used to think about that. Like, how can we learn about God from our kids? Our kids are dum-dums. They're gonna come out, they're not gonna know anything. What are they gonna teach me about God? And what your kids teach you about God is unconditional love, sacrifice, patience, desires that you've never understood. And those are the same ways that God looks at you. He says, I love you even more than you love your kids. You imagine that? You thought, your you thought God's love for you was conditional. Your love for your kids isn't conditional. You would give anything for your kids. And your kids teach you. Well, Jesus here uses this as a teachable moment. He says, hey, look at verse 14. Let the little children, red letters, come to me and don't forbid them. And he says, you know what? For of such is the kingdom of God. And assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Jesus says, you know what I really want from you guys? I want you to be a little more childlike. Listen, not childish, childlike. He's not advocating for childish faith, dumb, dumb faith, immature faith, rebellious faith, but childlike faith. Because there's something special about kids, something so special, something so innocent, something so pure. And what happens is, is you go from being a child to becoming an adult, to becoming an older adult, to becoming a crusty adult. You guys, you guys anybody crusty? Crusty Christians, oh, we gotta be more serious. There's serious stuff going on. Can't be so happy, you know? Why are you so happy? This Halloween, we live in the Agate Beach and we rarely get trick-or-treaters, but sometimes we get a couple of them. So I came up with this little scam, this Halloween scam. I don't wanna buy candy at my house, so what I do is a couple days before Halloween, I'll go to various places of business like I always do, whether it's a store or a bank, and whenever I do, and they're giving away Halloween candy, I'll take three or four pieces. And I'll put it in my pocket. And I do this for the first week, right before Halloween, and I get like 10 to 12 pieces, and I just start stealing candy from everywhere. 
and then I have it by my front door in case we do get a trick-or-treater. You know, I want to have some candy on site, you know? It's my little scam. You guys can lean into it. But we upped the game a little bit this year, too. We actually turned the lights off. We, like, pretended we weren't home. Like, we're not even home. We just chilled out. And I was so excited because my kids are all, they're not into Halloween anymore. We don't need to go to all the things. And I began to think, this is going to be so fun. Got the lights out. I stole a bunch of candy. Nobody's coming over. And, and I realized I was a crusty, I was a crusty adult. Like, I got old. I just sat there being old, eating my Snickers and stuff like that. <sighs> Jesus says, you know what? I don't want you guys to have child ish faith, but I want you to have childlike faith. I think it was the day before, it was Wednesday, uh, we had the harvest party here, Pastor Roy put that on, and there was about 90 kids here in the sanctuary. I stopped by at the very end, I was supposed to get over at eight, I, I heard eight, I got here at eight, it gets over at 8.30, so I showed up and I walked in the sanctuary. I could only be in here for about six or seven minutes before my blood pressure went through the roof. I had a minor heart attack, I was like, I gotta go, this is crazy. And right in the middle there was Roy with the microphone, they're doing all kinds of stuff, having so much fun. In the house of God, 90 kids. Lincoln City Youth Group came down. It was so rad. And I'm thank, I thank God for Pastor Roy. He's been our pastor for, youth pastor for nine years now. When he first moved here, he was curious about the Lord and walking in his faith and trying to figure stuff out. And I began to pour into him and I began to see that he had a sensitivity towards kids. And I was like, wait a minute. Is this our youth pastor? Is this the guy? And he's been serving the youth here at this church ever since. So thankful for our kids ministry, for Katrina Thomas who runs upstairs and downstairs for all the volunteers, it takes a special guy, a special gal, special people to volunteer in the kids' wing to serve those kids, and yet Jesus says, hey, I'm gonna teach you stuff through those kids. I'm gonna make you more into my kingdom and more about me if you would just trust the process. I'm so glad this story happens here. Notice it's the guys that bring the kids to Jesus. In the Greek, uh, it's the masculine term, look at verse 13. It says, then they brought, they brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. Stop right there, eyes up here. The word they is in the masculine tense, which means this was the dads. I would expect, I wouldn't have been surprised if the moms, a bunch of ladies show up with the kids on their hips, like, hey, Jesus, would you bless my kid? Baptize him. Don't baptize, that's no, there's no baptism involved in the story. Dedicate them to the Lord, but it's the dads. And dads and moms both have an obligation to raise their kids, to lead them to Jesus, to protect them, to raise them up in the things of God. But there's a lot of power and a lot of influence that comes from the dads. There's a lot of obligation that comes from the male leader. Now you're gonna get in trouble, people are gonna misunderstand you in 2024, what you mean by that, but that's the way that the Bible has ordered it. And I would encourage you dads, the dudes, uncles and grandpas and brothers and dads, step up, bring your kids to Jesus, it's on you. I'm so thankful for my parents. We lived in Bend, Oregon, and right around age nine, we moved to Minnesota. And when we moved to Minnesota, they pulled me out of Bear Creek Christian or Bear Creek Elementary School in Bend. We got to Minnesota and we began to homeschool. And the reason we began to homeschool is so my parents could have a better watch on us, pour into us, disciple us in that way, because when we were in Bend, Oregon, my dad and mom were friends with some people, the Higgins family, in Bend, and my dad noticed one day that the dad was hugged by the 18-year-old son. He had a 17 and 18-year-old son, and the 18-year-old son embraced his dad and gave him a big hug. And my dad went up to that dad and said, how'd you get your son to do that? Most 18-year-olds aren't hugging their dad. How did you do that? He said, oh, we homeschool our kids. We pour into them, we have value, and we're doing that. Not everyone needs to homeschool their kids, don't get me wrong. But my parents then pulled me out and poured into me in that way and they took me to summer camps and they took me to VBSs and took me to all these things and I'm so thankful that my parents exposed me to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, some of you know my story. At age eight in Bend, Oregon, my parents took me to church. And I was one of those kids that didn't like to go to Sunday school. I like to stick, sit in the big church and in Sunday school, I'm sorry, in big church, on that Sunday is when God called me into the ministry. He spoke to my heart and he said, you're gonna do what that man's doing on stage. That is your future. And it was so real. And so powerful. Actually, it freaked me out as a little kid. I, didn't, I, just, I needed counseling after that. I'm not even kidding you. I was all messed up. It scared me. And had my parents not taken me to church, had they not taken me to Jesus, who knows what Jesus would have had to do to get my attention. And I would just say, not only is it taking them to camps and taking them to schools and doing what you can. Listen, my mom and dad are probably on, online watching and at home right now. I love you guys. One thing my, my parents didn't know at that time, though, I'm just gonna be honest, is my parents knew the rules, they knew the truth. We were kind of legalistic back then. They taught me about the way, the truth, and how to get there, but they didn't know how to teach me yet. They, they know now grace. See, this is important that your parents, you take your kids to a school, take them to a camp, take them to church, but you gotta also show them what Jesus looks like at home. Because the last thing we wanna do is pretend we're Christians at church and then go home and fail miserably and then raise up kids that were under the leadership of hypocrites. 
But let's be honest, how many of us, when we get home, we take the mask off, let the guard down, some flesh shows up every once in a while, and that's an opportunity to let Jesus be real at home. Hey, I shouldn't have raised my voice. Hey, I shouldn't have lost my temper. Hey, I shouldn't have messed up right here. Have you ever asked your kids to forgive you? It's a humbling experience. Have you ever forgiven your kids when they've blown it, extended grace and mercy? Jesus in real time. Teach your kids who Jesus is. Teach them the ways of the kingdom of God. Not just the truth, not just the rules. Because kids respond in a way that I think attracts Jesus. As a matter of fact, all these kids are coming. The disciples said, no, Jesus doesn't have time. He says, yeah, I got plenty of time for that. I love the kids. I'm putting up with you adults. Bring the kids here. Let me give you four things that kids have that he probably wants us to have as well. He wants us to have childlike faith, not childish faith. Write these things down. He wants us to have joyful faith, a faith that's full of joy. Kids, kids aren't really that hard to get to have a good time. They're pretty fired up. Joy's right there. You and I, we expect and we demand a lot more before we get excited about things. We need some more knowledge, more insight, more instruction, more explanation. Kids need none of that to have fun. We know a lot, we can explain a lot, and we have very little joy. Kids don't know hardly anything. Kids can't explain much, but they're having so much fun. And as you get older, you got more questions and need more stuff, and your joy meter goes way down. Don't do that. Let's have joyful faith. Not only that, what about trusting faith? Kids are pretty trusting, aren't they? When a kid gets up in the morning, he walks over to the refrigerator and he opens it, he expects to see food. He's not really worried about it. Like, oh, oh, we had food last week, but I'm not sure if my dad's gonna get food this week. I just don't know. They trust. You and I, we wonder if God was faithful last week, but I don't know if he's gonna be there for me this week. And our faith goes all up and down and we wonder if we're gonna make it. Most kids don't wonder if they're gonna make it. They know for a fact mom and dad got it taken care of. They have trusting faith. Kids don't ask for budgets and PL statements and all kinds of analysis. They just know dad's gonna take care of it. Did you, did you know? Beyond your budget and your PL profit and loss statement, beyond your analysis, beyond the economy, did you know that your father said he's gonna take care of all your needs? Do you know that? That's what he said. We're like, yeah, but who doesn't know what's really going on? And eh, he totally does. Have joyful faith, have trusting faith. Kids also have eager faith, kids are just pumped. You ask a kid how they're doing, hey, what's going on? Kids are just eager to do stuff. It takes us a while as adults to get eager to do anything. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but for the last nine years at South Beach Church, every single service, I start out the exact same way. Have you guys noticed that? Well, everybody, good morning to you guys. How y'all doing out there? Have you guys noticed that? I've noticed it. Every single Sunday for nine years, no variation. I actually talk, typed it into chat GPT. I was like, can you spice this up a little? And chat GPT said, that's perfect. Just keep doing it. I, I didn't do that. And here's why I do it. Because I asked you guys how you're doing, and I give you an invitation to get eager to worship God, to get the crusties off, to get eager to learn from God, to lean into the, Jesus said, if you don't approach me like a child does, you're not going to heaven. What? Well, I know more than that kid does. And Jesus says, I don't care. I'm looking at your heart. Nicodemus knew more than any other person in Jerusalem. And yet Jesus says, you gotta become born again. Speaking of a supernatural reality, you gotta become new. You gotta become a kid. And kids have eager faith. And I just would, man, let's not become so crusty and finally not just a joyful faith, trusting faith and eager faith, but satisfied faith. Kids are just, they're easy to, they're really easy to calm down. They don't need a lot of explanation. As a matter of fact, if you tell a kid that heaven's gonna be awesome, they'll ask you a few questions. Will I have to go to school there? <laughs> no, no more school. What? No more homework, no more brushing your teeth. Okay, stop right there. Kids are ready to go. Ready to go to heaven. <laughs> say, say less, I'm ready to go, I'm satisfied. Now as adults, we're like, well, I gotta read the fine print. How do we really know where heaven is? Blah, blah, blah. We ask a bunch of questions. Kids are satisfied. Man, wouldn't that be rad if we were like this? Now, let me just underscore this a little bit. I don't want us to become childish. I want us to become childlike. Jesus, though, was approached one time and he was argued with with a bunch of Pharisees in John chapter five. And in John chapter five, he says this. John chapter five, verse 38 through 40. He says, but you, you don't have his word abiding in you. These were Bible students. Because whom he sent, him you do not believe. And then verse 39, you should commit this to memory. 
You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Stop right there, eyes up here. Put verse 39 out there for me, Dave. Would you look at this? You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Leave that up there. These guys had excellent theology, and they missed God altogether. Do you know most young people have really poor theology? <laughs> you might even say to yourself, I don't have a lot of good theology. I don't really know a lot about the Bible. And God, I believe, this is my own personal opinion, I believe God is less interested in your theology and the accuracy thereof, and he's more interested in the condition of your heart. Let's say you had 99% inaccuracy in your theology, but you knew this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. What if you knew that? And everything else is all backwards. Your end times and eschatology was all messed up and your hermeneutics and your homiletics and all, it was all backwards and you didn't know how to diverse and parse verbs and all, you didn't know how to do all that stuff. And you said, I know Jesus loves me. And Jesus said, I'd like to have coffee with you. And then there's another group of people though that search the scriptures for in them, they think they have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. Jesus was right there with theologi- theological buffs. Guys that could do it all. Looking over his head. Guys, this story is convicting to me. Hopefully it's convicting to you too. Let's have more childlike faith. Yeah, but Luke, the economy, what about it? Yeah, but the government, what about it? Yeah, but all these things, what about it? We sang an amazing song. That last song was so good. I'd never heard that song until this morning. We're fighting a battle that's already been won. What? Do you believe that? Yeah, the battle's real. You're fighting it. It's already been won? (laughs) That changes the way we fight it. That changes the way we fight it. You already got the Super Bowl ring. Can you imagine playing in the Super Bowl, but it's been predicted that your team wins and you already have the, the ring on and you're playing in it, you're gonna win no matter what. How much fun would you have? Even if you blew it, oh, I fumbled. We could, you're still gonna win. Oh, I got sacked, we're still gonna win. We've all fumbled, we've all got sacked, we've all had some really bad plays in this game, but God's already won it. Oh, I'm convicted. Well, not only am I convicted, but this next guy, we're gonna study his story in two weeks. I meant to do it in one week, but there wasn't enough time this morning. Look what happens next. It says, now he was going out on the road. One came running and knelt before him and asked him, saying, hey, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Kind of cool, he just got done teaching on this, like, dude, were you not listening? You gotta become like a child. Maybe he didn't hear that. This guy shows up, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's actually a really good question. It's not a wrong question, it's a good question. Well, then Jesus, verse 18, said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Stop right there, eyes up here. You would never use that word good to a rabbi in those days. You would never call somebody that. It's too high of a compliment. And so Jesus noticed that he had an understanding that he was God. He's like, do you know what you're saying? Nobody's good but God. Do you know what you're saying? Remember, he had just asked his disciples previously, who do you say that I am? We gotta get this figured out. Why? Because if you know I'm God, if you do know I'm God, guess what's gonna help moving forward? Your obedience. If you know I'm God, you're not gonna argue with me. This is huge, by the way, because we all argue with the Lord, don't we? Jesus is about to ask this guy to do some really hard stuff, and he wants to clarify before he moves on. Make sure we got this. By the way, I hope that helps you in your obedience struggles this week. If you really believe he's God and he's good and he's for you, okay, put a stake in it. Settle it. Do the right thing. By his power, for his glory, through his grace. Don't mess around anymore. Because he's God. It settles the deal. And when you know who he is, you know who you are, period. And so Jesus says, hey, there's only one that's good. I want to be, I'm about, we're gonna get into some deep waters here. This guy just asked, what can I do to go to heaven? Jesus said, why are you calling me good? I wanna make sure you know. He gives him an opportunity, and this is for you too, to contemplate these things, to lean in. Why? What do I think of you? Sheesh, that changes everything. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Your name changes, your destiny changes, your history changes. Well, Jesus goes on. He said, verse 19, he says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness, that's lying. Do not defraud, that's coveting. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Stop right there, eyes up here. Interesting, Jesus gives him six commandments. You guys know there are 10 commandments. 
The first four are vertical in nature. God's giving us instruction and commands to worship God this way. The next six listed here are horizontal in nature, the way we relate with humanity. Now, Jesus only gives six. One commentator suggested that Jesus was gonna give all 10, which, by the way, you Bible students know there's 603 more commandments in the Old Testament, 613 total. But if you focus on the 10, the 603 won't be a problem for you. So Jesus just kind of gives them these six One commentator suggested, though, as Jesus was talking, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't steal, don't defraud. And as he went through this, the guy said, yeah, 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 I I did all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys ever, yeah, 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 people? You ever ever catch catch yourself, yeah, 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 yeah. I do this from time to time. People will be telling me their story or talking. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, wait, I'm not listening. Because I talk to people all the time, and when I'm talking to them, if they give me the yeah yeahs, I realize that they're not there to learn. They're not there to receive. And I don't wanna do that to people. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm not listening. And maybe Jesus was gonna go into the other four commandments here. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you see his answer, it's pretty, pri- it's pretty strong. He goes on. The heck? He goes on. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Like, he's pretty f- solid. Now, how many of you guys at this point, if Jesus came to you and said, hey, you wanna get to heaven? You're like, yeah, what do I need to do? Don't lie. You're like, it's too late. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Don't steal, don't. And he goes through the list, you're like, bro, this guy's crazy. He's like, I did all that. It's like, really interesting. Now, Jesus qualified this, and he talked to us about anger. Remember, he said, if you have anger towards somebody, it's the same as murder. You might not have killed somebody outwardly, but it's the same. Same with lust. He said, if you've lusted after somebody, he said, it's the same as committing adultery. If you've stolen in your heart, your jealousy and envy and all these things, the reality is all 10 of the commandments, each and every one of us have failed miserably. All of them. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And when Jesus comes to us and we say, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus gave him this law, not because, well, actually, I should say it differently. There's two ways to heaven. One is through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ over your sins. The other way is to never sin, okay? That camp's real small, okay? Nobody's doing, nobody's doing that. No. People in this guy thought he was there. He's getting kicked out of the campground. You can't be here. You just lied. Get out of here. Did you know the law, by the way, when Jesus gave this to him, six things? He gave it to him as a mirror. And when you see a mirror, everybody the same. When you see a mirror, the first thing you do is you adjust. You're like, oh, hmm, I, didn't, hmm. I didn't realize that was there. And you start to comb your hair. Start to brush your tooth. <laughs> we all wake up in the morning, we try and fix it. Some ladies start painting the barn first thing, you know, put, you know, help it out, something's wrong. And we start fixing stuff. When the law is given to you, it's not so we can start adjusting, it's so we can see, oh man, I'm in trouble. Jesus wants you, wants me, wants us to go to heaven. He wants us to, the law is a tutor that leads us to Christ. The intention of the 613 commands isn't to show us that we can do it ourselves, but it's to illustrate not only how holy God is, like, whoa, but how unholy I am. And that's not the end of the message. The Lord says, okay, I'll fulfill it for you. I'll be the bridge between heaven and earth. You can come to heaven through me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And this guy asked, can I go to heaven? He's like, yeah, I'm gonna get to the heart of the issue. This guy was prideful. He's rich and he's young and he's a ruler. Okay, we value all three of these attributes this guy has. He's the only one in the entire Bible that comes to Jesus on his knees asking for help and leaves worse than he came. Did you know that? Lepers, invalids, people with dead people in their family, every one of them came to Jesus asking for help. They all left better. This guy, rich, young, and a ruler, got from Jesus the best counsel he'd ever received and he left worse than when he got there. We're gonna talk about his real issue. We're gonna run out of time today. Let me just show you, though, something to think about. Look at verse 21, then Jesus looking at him, that word looking at him is the same word Jesus used in the gospel of Luke when Peter had sinned and Jesus caught him. Not caught him into sin like a bad guy, but caught him from failing. Jesus looked, he beheld, he held him deep. And then it goes on to use another interesting word. Jesus looking at him loved him. That's the word agape, which means unconditional love. And he said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and take up your cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now Jesus here is helping this young man get freed of the things that were holding him back. 
Number one, it was his pride. He's like, hey, have you done all these things? And he mistakenly said, yeah, I've done all those things. Wow. Okay, well, there's another thing going on in your life. You have too much stuff. Having stuff is not a sin, but when your stuff has you, it is a sin. We all have lots of stuff. Don't we have so much stuff? How much stuff do you guys have? I have so much stuff. As Americans, we have so much stuff. We have rooms just for stuff. Like, what's that room for? That's just for stuff. What about that other thing in the back? Oh, there's more stuff out there. I actually rent a place across town for the rest of my stuff. (laughs) And I pay somebody to watch my stuff so no one steals my stuff, you know. We call insurance companies. Can you insure my stuff? (laughs) So much stuff. Careful. And Jesus said, here's the deal. I want to clarify this. Jesus gave this guy a prescription. This was a unique moment in time for him. This guy was prohibited from understanding the deeper truths of God. And he said, you know why? It's because you have too much stuff. This is not a verse that we're gonna apply to the rest of us. You know what we need to do to go to heaven? We all need to sell our stuff to everyone and and have no stuff. This was for him because Jesus knew this was the big deal. One commentator actually suggested that had this man looked at Jesus and said, okay, I'm gonna do it, that maybe Jesus in that moment would have stopped him and said, no, I was just testing you. Let's be best friends. Remember Abraham when Abraham had Isaac, the promised son, and God said, okay, I wanna make sure your heart is mine, bro. Take your only son and go sacrifice him. And Abraham said, that's heavy duty, but I trust you. And he went to go do it. And an angel stopped him and said, no, I was just testing you. That's crazy. Man, you're about to go to jail for that. (laughs) And maybe the Lord is just testing this guy. But I do believe this to be true. This was a unique situation for him. If anybody brings this verse and says, this is what you need to do, follow my ministry, give all your stuff and follow me, don't do that. Walk away from that person. And yet I do know that all the things in our life that rival idols, and they'll take you out. They will mess you up. And this is a very relevant message for today's day and age in the affluence that we live in, the comfort. This guy's known as a, rule, a rich young ruler, and yet every single person in this room has more comfort and more affluence than he did in his day. And the Lord would argue and wrestle for your heart as well. Where's your heart, Luke? How's your stuff? Is your stuff taking precedence in your life? Is there too much stuff going on? Only you can answer that. Only I can answer that. And the Lord says to me as we get older and older and as we realize that the stuff that we've had, the stuff that we've looked for satisfaction, it doesn't quite bring the satisfaction that we're looking for. And the Lord says it never will. Take up your cross and follow me. What an invitation. Giving up the stuff, that's fine. Talk about it. Think about it. What's holding you back? The bigger invitation was, hey, come on, let's go. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus was inviting him into fellowship And I believe these stories in contrast are perfect for us to chew on all week long. Lord, how's my faith? Is it childlike? Am I all anxious? Am I all messed up? If you've ever seen a messed up, anxious kid, it's all bound up by fears, all bound up by anxiety, you you know it's it's not right. Some kids get that way through trauma, through things, imbalance, like, whoa, 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 this isn't okay. Kids are supposed to be, kids are kids. And the Bible invites you and implores me to have that type of faith. But not only that, to have childlike faith, and I'm gonna have the worship team come up and they're gonna lead us in a closing song right now. Here's the other thing I want you to chew on this week, though. What are the things in your life that are robbing you of joy? The things that are taking you from being full on into the things of God. Next week, I'll explore this just a little bit more. We're real quick to feed our idols. Whatever it is in your life that you love, entertainment, travel, some hobby, we do these things. And not everything is innately bad and most things aren't even bad. But the Lord wants you and me to find ourselves saying, Lord, search my heart. Make me more available to you. Jesus said, if you give everything you own, you're gonna have treasure in heaven. How many guys are living for heavenly principles right now? Again, this is such a huge challenge for us we're Americans, we've got this freedom, we've got the independence, we've got the constitution, we've got the right the, to pursue happiness. We're the freest nation in the world. The Lord says, ooh, that's gonna be tough for you guys. That's gonna be tough. Keep my spirit right there. Keep my word right there. Stay focused. As a matter of fact, let's all stand up. We're gonna say a couple of simple prayers and we're gonna sing a song. We're gonna ask God to break every chain. Lord, in Jesus' name, would you have your way in our hearts. Help us to be, Lord, like those children, joyful faith and resting faith, satisfied faith, eager faith. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, those kids climbing all over Jesus like he was a jungle gym. Lord, make us men and women who are set free. And maybe it's directly connected to the things of this world that are holding you back. 
Maybe somebody here today would take a step of faith and say, I need to simplify. What am I doing? I don't need an extra that or another one of these. And my stuff, I got so much stuff. Lord, I, I pray there'd be no un, undue condemnation in this room whatsoever, Lord. No one feeling weird or guilty. But that there would be, Lord, an excitement of conviction saying, yeah, you need to simplify and intensify. Simplify the things of this world and intensify the things of God. Do you want treasure in heaven? Do you want to be fruitful? Do you want to do the things that I've called you to do? Yes, I do. Matter of fact, if you're here this morning and you're not sure you're a Christian, I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus for him to be your savior. The Bible says that if you call upon the name of the Lord, if you believe in him with your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. This is what he does. If you're here this morning and you want to make sure you leave knowing that you're a Christian and you're saved, would you right now confess him by raising up your hand right now? Say, yeah, I want to be saved in Jesus' name right now. I see hands going up. Jesus' name. Anybody join these? Three, four, five, seven. Hands all over the auditorium. Yes, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Would you secure and save and settle in Jesus' name? May all of heaven erupt, Lord. We love you. And Lord, for the rest of us in Jesus' name, for all of us, we pray that you would again tenderize our hearts, receive us as we are, Lord, but make us into the sons and daughters you want us to be. We ask that, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Hey, let's sing a worship song. There's prayer people coming up on my left and right. If you need prayer, come get some. Let's worship the Lord together.